What can cardiac electrophysiology offer my primary care practice is our topic, and this is kind of going to be a high-level overview of the field. Big broad picture, help us think in broad strokes, but organize a lot of complicated ideas and show their relationships to each other. And in point of fact, that's the level at which I think. Everything we do has to make sense at the level we're going to talk tonight, or it's not going to work and it's not a good idea. So. I'm not dumbing this down because this is how I think, and I think you'll appreciate it, and I hope get some insights. So any questions, just um, don't hesitate to ask. A few disclosures that are not relevant. Obviously, this is a broad informational session. How you treat your patient is up to you. Um, I think we all understand that. So we're happy to assist with patients, and patients usually have symptoms. They have palpitations, heart racing, they feel their pulses irregular, they have skip beats or pauses, they black out, they have unexplained falls. All these things can have electrical etiologies and we're happy to get involved to evaluate those symptoms, even if it's just a symptom, you don't have to have a diagnosis. Things that we do, pacemaker implant and management, so regular pacemakers, his bundle pacemakers that I'll talk about, defibrillators, subcutaneous defibrillators, resynchronizing devices, they all have their appropriate place in treating certain individuals. And then arrhythmia therapy, the backbone of our program, atrial fibrillation, our biggest complex ablation, um, tremendous burden on the population, lots of room for advanced therapy in atrial fibrillation. And then all of the SVTs and these nuisance rhythms, and something that primary care docs can be very sensitive to are PVCs. When you have an EKG that shows a lot of PVCs, your first clue should be Holter monitor and refer to EP for um, further management. And I get a lot of my referrals directly from the primary care community. And um, it's nice that we all understand exactly how important those things can be. So let's talk about device therapy. Start very simply with pacemakers. Who to refer for pacemakers? Anyone who might need a pacemaker if you are concerned as a provider about potentially slow heart rate, heart block, heart block pauses, patients with fatigue, dizziness, syncope, things of this nature, refer. We're happy to evaluate. We won't do anything appropriate. These people often need pacemakers and we'll take care of you, take care of it for you. And then patients who have pacemakers. You can program pacemakers. You can optimize pacemakers. And I think anyone with one of these devices deserves to pass through the office of an electrophysiologist at least occasionally so we can help and diagnose. If you see on your device report that there's ventricular pacing above 20%, good chance that patient is going to go on to develop a cardiomyopathy as a result of the ventricular pacing. They might need a revision of some sort, and we can take care of that for you. And then pacemakers give you lots of information. There's the diagnostics. We see other rhythms, SVTs, flutters, atrial fibrillation, and we have to manage all of these things, particularly if they're symptomatic. So information from the pacemaker, we can help you make sense of and um, know what to do with it. So let's talk about some updates. This is not a static field. This is a very dynamic field. We have to think whether our pacemaker should be single chamber or dual atria, ventricle, or both? Should we be pacing that ventricle from the his bundle position instead of the RV apex where we've always done it up until now? Or should that be a two lead system in the ventricle to pace from both sides? When would we make the distinction? We want those devices now to be MRI compatible. We won't, should not implant a pacemaker that's not MRI compatible. We want to reproduce physiologic heart rates, restore normal physiology to patients, not just prevent dangerously slow heart rhythms. We actually want it to reproduce the perfect heart rate for that person. We want there to be ventricular synchrony. If you're pacing the bottom chamber, we don't want that pacemaker to be causing dyssynchronous rhythms that are going to be adverse um, for that individual. Again, the diagnostics and monitoring, we're harvesting a ton of information from the pacemaker and we need to know how to make sense of that. We now have pacemakers that can not only diagnose atrial fibrillation, but they can treat atrial fibrillation. Very interesting. And we'll talk about those and see where those fit in. So we need a pacemaker. Most common reason for a pacemaker is someone has chronotropic incompetence. Their heart rhythm is normal. Their heart just goes too slow. So we supplement them in the top chamber of their heart, exactly where the electrical impulse comes from, restore normal heart rates. Here we see a single chamber atrial pacemaker. There's a, a lead only in the atrial chamber. 
to supplement that normal heart rate. And we like that in young patients, 50 is young. In 20, 30 year olds, this is our preferred device for this indication, and um, we just don't want excess junk in the patient's body which may become dysfunctional with time. So we can solve um, individuals' needs with this pacemaker. Here's actually a very good friend of mine, 50 years old, always feeling sluggish. We put a monitor on him for five days, showed his heart rates were exceedingly slow, implanted him with a single chamber pacemaker, 77% pacemaker um, burden, normalized his heart rates, and you can see the difference in his exercise regimen from 10 days before the pacemaker to two months after, and how beautifully that fills it out with um, very simple technology. That's MRI compatible, senses the heart rate you want by how forcefully the heart's trying to contract. Not just when you move, but when you think, solve problems, get frustrated, your heart will react to the catecholamines in your body and the pacemakers can pick up on that, give you the appropriate heart rate. Interesting, interesting technology. Traditionally, this is the pacemaker we've always implanted, the dual chamber pacemaker. Here's someone with complete heart block and that's a beautiful implant and we see a, a lead both in the atria and then the tip of the right ventricle. What we've learned that if you pace that bottom chamber in that position over 20% of the time, that person will go on to develop a cardiomyopathy. And we want to be very sensitive to that and offer individuals um, something better. Historically, when that was the case, we would add a second pacing lead to the left ventricle. We could pace left and right ventricle together and that seemed to compensate for the problem and there's a role for that, but we have something even newer, and that is a His bundle um, pacemaker, where now we are pace placing that lead not in the bottom of the heart, but in the top of the heart, right where the electrical system comes from. With Medtronic technology, we can put a pacing lead right in the electrical system, engage the electrical system the way the heart would normally, provide normal heart rates to the bottom chamber in a way which will not cause the cardiomyopathy with high pacing burdens. Really a very um, revolutionary thing for us. We implanted the first one of these devices in Washington State in June of this year and um, have the highest uh, implant volume in the state um, to date. And this is really transforming the way that we use um, pacemaker therapy. And you notice the chest x-ray has those subtle changes that correspond to that new lead position. And we share what we do. I happen to be on the editorial board for EP Lab Digest and write a number of scholarly type articles two, three times a year, and we shared our early experience with his bundle pacing, calling that Houston, we have a solution to the problem of right ventricular pacing. This technology really overcomes um, those problems which have, has dogged our profession for so long and um, that article's been very well received, encouraging other labs around the country to adopt this technology, because in point of fact, it's not that hard. Pacemakers can treat AFib. Here's what we see, a cardiac compass report. The top graph is 24 hours in a day as we go month to month for almost a year, and you can see a high burden of atrial fibrillation in that, in that individual, certainly somebody who needs an ablation. We turn on atrial ATP therapy, which is a Medtronic technology, bursts pace into the atria when it sees that, at that atrial fibrillation passing through periods of when the rhythm is organized. And in fact, pacing at the right rate at the right time can terminate atrial fibrillation. And here we see from the pink line going forward how the atrial fibrillation has virtually been eliminated by the pacemaker. Here's someone referred to me for ablation. Now he doesn't need an ablation because the pacemaker is solving the problem. Spectacular, and that's very interesting, and it can be very successful in the right individual. Implantable cardioverter defibrillators, that's what ICD stands for. Sometimes I don't even know that. Sudden cardiac death is, <laughs> a lot of days I don't know that. So <laughs> sudden cardiac death's a big problem. 350,000 people in the United States per year die suddenly from heart arrhythmias. So if that's the iceberg, everyone below water does not qualify for an ICD. We can't predict who they are reliably. They're gonna drop dead, and our guidelines do not protect that very large cohort. Everyone above water is gonna have sudden cardiac death and is within ICD guidelines. Still, even those who meet guideline criteria, nationally we only implant 20% with defibrillators, leaving a very large proportion of our population unprotected. 
So our role as providers is to identify folks who qualify for ICDs and offer them that technology when it's appropriate. So to make it easy in the primary care environment, because often our primary care docs are ordering echoes, getting the report, and no one else sees that. If the ejection fraction is less than 35%, you likely qualify for an implantable defibrillator. And that's an appropriate referral directly to me. And I'll help sort out whether the details are there and whether it is in fact important. That doesn't have to go to a cardiologist or, may, or who may or may not um, be up to date on the latest indications. So that's the time to pick up the phone and um, give me a call when you find those things. And um, why do people have sudden death? It's because they have coronary disease. And coronary disease is vast in our population. Some people have a lot, some people have a little. But individuals have small heart attacks, a little bit of scar in their heart. That introduces electrical instability, where quite randomly, this event can happen. Normal rhythm turns into tachycardia. And as the heart's energy depletes, that signal gets smaller until it is flatline. And unless you intervene very quickly, that individual is finished. So this is the pathology that we're attempting to prevent. Primary prophylaxis, you've never had an arrhythmia. The pump function of your heart is just low. That's appropriate for a defibrillator, whether that's an ischemic heart or a non-ischemic heart. And then obviously, if you've survived a ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation event, you qualify for an implantable defibrillator. So in either of those scenarios, um, direct referral to me or a call to me, I'm, I'm happy to help out and work through that. So our implant considerations are now very similar to what they were for the pacemaker. Do we want a single chamber ICD, a dual chamber ICD? Should that ICD be under the skin rather than through the venous system? Should it have resynchronizing pacing for a ventricle that is not able to coordinate its contraction? And should that pacing, in fact, be coming from a His bundle lead as opposed to um, from the left ventricle or right ventricle? We want that device, obviously, to treat the arrhythmia, but they all do that, and they do that pretty well. So now it has to be MRI compatible. If it's going to pace, we want physiologic pacing rates, just like before. We want the pacing to be ventricularly synchronous. We want that device to diagnose and treat atrial fibrillation when it can. And we want all of the monitoring capability that helps us learn so much else about our patients. So we go for this in our ICDs. This is actually my first implant in private practice. 59-year-old male had a V fib arrest during sex with his wife after he had applied testosterone patches all over his body to get himself fired up for the event. <coughs> and this is what we like in that single chamber defibrillator. We see the device, it's bigger than the pacemaker, single lead in the right ventricle, the thicker coil is the part that can apply the shock between the coil and the device, defibrillate the patient's heart. We want minimum hardware, single lead, single coil, that device can act like a pacemaker. It's a perfectly good pacemaker, but as you know, we don't want to pace in that bottom chamber any more than 20%. I mean, even 2% gets under my skin. And um, that's really there to protect you from dangerous arrhythmias and not to function as a pacemaker. Medtronic, and we have some of their display models here, have the physio curve. It's the first shaped ICD which reduces skin tension from the device, has a better cosmetic effect, very popular with our patients, and we've studied that and published on that, and a very interesting piece of technology. Medtronic being a company with full suite MRI for all of its implantable devices. So that's good to know, because not everyone can claim that. So this is the single chamber defibrillator. But you can ask, if we don't want this to act as a pacemaker, just to protect, then why not put it under the skin? And this technology is available too. In the right patient, particularly someone young, you can protect them from having anything going through their blood vessels and into their heart by putting that device under the skin on the side and the defibrillator under the skin, but outside your thorax, up the middle. That device sandwiches the heart electrically and it can reliably shock you out of dangerous rhythms. So this is the subcutaneous device. And there's someone on post-procedure day one with their incision sites and the schematic to show you how that technology should apply. X-ray is very different. We see the device now is on your side rather than up in your chest. 
important to have it posterior enough so that electrically the myocardium is sandwiched, so that an electrical shock between the defibrillator coil and the device will pass through the heart, sandwich the myocardium, and adequately defibrillate. They work very well in somebody who just needs uh, defibrillator protection. Presently that's, a, presently, that's a Boston Scientific product. Medtronic has one on the way, and so other companies are getting involved. This was the topic of an article that got published in the Tri-Cities Herald, where we implanted the subcutaneous defibrillator in this patient, Angela Huggins, who was a young woman in her 30s, postpartum cardiomyopathy, resistant to medical therapy, chronically depressed ejection fraction. We wanted all of the hardware outside of the heart and vasculature, and uh, she received a subcutaneous ICD. So for those young um, patients where we want to preserve as long as possible, that's a great device. How about a dual chamber pacemaker? You only really want one of those when that patient can benefit from pacing in the top chamber. So when somebody is slow and you can solve that problem by pacing them in their top chamber, you'll add that second defibrillator lead or that second pacing lead to a defibrillator system. We used to think that those two leads would help the device figure out if it was a rhythm that needed to be shocked or not. Turns out it doesn't add that much. So really it's the pacing indication. And here is somebody from this month, came into the hospital in that rhythm, ventricular tachycardia at 213 beats a minute, had to be shocked out of it, and then in normal rhythm they are slow. Sinus Brady in the 40s have always been slow, sluggish, so they get the atrial lead, provides the pacemaker function by that same mechanism, sensing the contractility of the heart, and we can normalize the heart rates, give the patient all the benefit of the pacemaker in a system that also acts as a defibrillator. So a nice technology for the right person. We will see in those folks who have the very low pump function, also there is so much electrical delay in the heart that the heart can't synchronize its contraction. So when there's a lot of electrical slowing with a bundle branch block, particularly left bundle branch block, one side of the heart starts to contract way before the other side needs knows to begin, and as a result, the heart can't coordinate. If it can't coordinate, it can't recover. In that situation, we have our two-chamber ICD, but now we've added an extra pacing lead, and the yellow arrow shows it, on the lateral wall of the left ventricle. We pace the right ventricle, we pace the lateral left ventricle, pull all of the myocardium into the contraction, synchronize the heart, and that's the stimulus that the heart needs to recover function. And this is so rewarding because patients feel better. They feel better as they get off the implant table, they feel better as they walk out the door on post-operative day one, and their hearts recover quite reliably over the weeks and months to follow. So it's a very, um, rewarding technology for um, the right patient. The thing to watch for is QRS widening. You have that low function patient, they have a wide electrical signal, they're probably gonna qualify for and um, benefit from, from a resynchronizing uh, device. So we do a large number of those. And it's also a topic that we take very seriously, and we've published on that in 2016 an article on how to optimize those devices, because how you program the thing is everything. Just putting it in and leaving it is wrong. <coughs> you have to pay attention to how it works and how it's capturing the heart electrically to get the benefit. And we wrote an article on how we should be doing that in our device clinics in a way to get the most bang for the buck. Because I'll tell you what, when you're in my position, you'll inherit patients who have these devices and have had them for years and have never received any benefit from this extremely expensive device. You make a few programming changes and suddenly they're getting full benefit and start to respond after having years of the thing, uh, in fact, doing nothing. And that's a depressing place to be. When you're in my shoes, you see that and it's nice to alert our field that programming is important. And in fact, that article was um, voted second most important um, article in EP Digest for, two, for 2016. So it's a big deal and um, something we take pride on. And that's another reason to send us those people so we can look at the programming, have the time to optimize those patients, make sure they're getting 
the most benefit from whatever device that they have implanted. If you have a defibrillator and someone just needs a lot of ventricular pacing, there's no reason not to pace them from that His bundle position. It's exactly what we did with the pacemakers. We can put in the His bundle lead, incorporate it into the ICD system, and those individuals can benefit. Here is somebody who had an ICD, but they were pacing 100% in their bottom chamber. The device came for change out. We said, you will do much better if we pace you from the His bundle position, and we gave them a lead in the His position. And you see the QRS narrowing from 170 milliseconds when you're pacing in the tip of the ventricle to 130 when you move it to the His position. So faster electrical activation of the heart, patient immediately notices the difference and feels better. So we're gonna now preserve that ventricle, give it the stimulus to recover, you know, and allow that person to, um, to do better. So all of these things mix and match together. What I'd like the primary care provider to remember is when you get that echo report back that says ejection fraction is 35% or less, think that you are in defibrillator country and this is an appropriate consult to an electrophysiologist to help make sure that all the criteria have been met, all the nuances are met. We'll work through that with you, but this is an important time to um, first get the primary doc involved. Awesome. So that's devices. That's how my brain works, that's how I think about uh, these things, and that's how, that's how I implant. Uh, so I hope that's been helpful. But let's move on to arrhythmias. We're electrical docs, abnormal rhythms are our thing, and there's a lot of advanced therapies that we can advance, uh, that we can offer to um, uh, on the appropriate patient. So we all know about atrial fibrillation. It is big and getting bigger, and so are the therapies that we can offer patients who have atrial fibrillation. So let's talk a little bit about the significance and management of AFib. Three million in people in the US have AFib. It's gonna be over 12 million by 2050. That's what's projected. That's 5% of people over age 65, 10% of people over age 75. It's the latest epidemic. It's like hypertension or diabetes. Atrial fibrillation is out there and it's only getting worse. And it matters. Why? Symptoms. People feel crappy in atrial fibrillation. Either they, act, they feel the irregularity and it drives them crazy, or they are just fatigued and wiped out all the time because the irregularity is um, adversely affecting their heart function, and that's how they experience it. Also, atrial fibrillation causes stroke. We have to identify AFib patients quickly and get them on appropriate therapy, or we are really leaving them at high risk for devastating events. So this is from my Yakima experience. Um, here is Mrs. R, age 88. She was happily enjoying retirement, swinging on her, sitting on her back porch um, swing, enjoying the summer, when suddenly this happens. She's now at Yakima Regional, in palliative care, right-sided stroke, can't move her right side, can't talk, understands most everything. She's DNR, DNI, and on her way to hospice care. You know, is that how you wanna, is that how you wanna finish retirement? The EKG for the first time that she's had one, atrial fibrillation. Slow rates, but it's that nasty rhythm. And we know that this is 36% of strokes in age 80 years and up is from AFib. These strokes are more disabling, they're more likely to recur, and they're more likely to be fatal than um, strokes due to other causes. Also, threefold increased risk of heart failure, twofold increased risk of heart attack, increased dementia, twofold increased risk of death in patients who suffer from atrial fibrillation. And it's not hard to see how a clot that forms in your left atrial appendage can, if it were to break loose, would get pumped straight to your brain, and they're just connected right like that, and, and cause a massive stroke. So not only the stroke and the symptoms, all these other things that atrial fibrillation predisposes to you, um, you too, we wanna help patients with that. So you can ask, as many people do, do I have atrial fibrillation? Well, symptoms can be non-existent to severe. Classic is sort of the palpitations. Fatigue is the most common. Your heart's racing and it's irregular. That's gonna be exhausting over time. It's like you're running a marathon. People have short of breath or they have no symptoms. At least they can't tell. Um, they're not aware of the rhythm. 
they likely have an unrecognized fatigue, but you have to honor their experience that they really can't tell. So then people ask, is that funny feeling my atrial fibrillation? I felt my heart do something odd. You know, symptoms are unreliable. 95% of AFib episodes are asymptomatic. Every bit is deadly, but asymptomatic. Suspicious symptoms incorrectly attributed to atrial fibrillation 85% of the time. So most of the time you're wrong, but you can't tell. And even people known to have symptomatic paroxysmal AFib will have asymptomatic episodes 10 times more often than they'll have symptomatic episodes. So symptoms are important, but symptoms are unreliable in predicting the burden of the disease. People who overestimate are those who are anxious and depressed. Those who underestimate have increased age or female gender. So that can help you in the puzzle. It immediately begs the question, if you have AFib, you need rhythm monitoring to tell how much you're in this rhythm and how much your heart races and whether the therapies we're offering you are actually controlling the arrhythmia. So we have ambulatory monitors. This is what we call king of hearts. You can wear them up to 30 days, external monitoring, and you can learn all about AFib in 30 days. But what happens after that? And what happens when we change therapy? You want, well, I don't know. Are we gonna repeat the 30-day monitor? We can, and that's one strategy. So now enter technology number three, which is the implantable loop recorder. The latest of these being the Medtronic product, the Reveal Link, um, a fantastic technology, replace their predecessor, which was the market standard, and there you see one in the palm of a hand, about the size of a finger, about the size of a um, paper clip. You simply slip this under someone's skin, seal it up with surgical glue, send them home 30 minutes later, and you have every beat of their heart for the next three years. We'll report automatically all the atrial fibrillation that anyone has, how fast their heart goes during AFib, and if the person wants to report symptoms to the monitors, you can understand their symptoms too, you can do all that. So there is the essence of the implant procedure. Again, we implanted the first one of this technology when it became available in March of 2014. And it's this plastic device that you slip under the skin. And that's used to deploy the device under the skin. And there you see immediately after the little insertion site, the dashed lines show you where that device is under the patient's skin. And then at two weeks, hardly distinguishable. If you feel it, you can tell it's under there. Just to look at somebody, you can't tell it's there. And um, people have wonderful experiences with loop recorder technology. The transmitter sits by your bed, automatically acts with, activates the interacts with the device while you're asleep, pushes it to a database available to our office. You have the patient assistant if you want to report symptoms. The doctor gets a beautiful report, can discuss it with you. It's like the future is here. So for atrial fibrillation, what I do is advanced therapy. When would a catheter ablation procedure, for example, be indicated for atrial fibrillation? This is management of AFib by the guidelines. We can use ablation if you have paroxysmal AF and you've tried at least one antiarrhythmic medication. Didn't work or the patient didn't like it for whatever reason. Class one indication to go to ablation. Class two A, that paroxysmal AF, you didn't try a drug, patient didn't want to, um, you can go to ablation as a 2A recommendation or a persistent AF after you've tried at least one medication. And then as a 2B for your persistent and long-standing persistence if they didn't want to try the medication or they tried at least one. So there's room in the guidelines for everybody to go to an AFib ablation. And we can help with the trials of the antiarrhythmics and things like that. A lot of people aren't really comfortable with these. We can get involved at the level of the antiarrhythmic drug and offer it to the right person and evaluate how they respond and help them with the decision to go on to an ablation procedure. 80% of my cases are persistent or longstanding persistent. The world is supposedly doing all this paroxysmal. In our population, we do persistence and in high volume, and we're doing them at the Yakima Regional Hospital right now in um, significant quantities and with increasing demand. So, who to refer? Primary care, who would you refer? I would say anyone less than 80 years of, old, years of age who's unsatisfied with medical management. They don't like their AFib, they don't like what's happening, 
they're not too old, statistically the complication rates start to climb after age 80. That's why we're sensitive about the number 80. Most of our ablations are at age 75. We'll quite readily offer it to somebody up through 77, 78. At age 80, you at least tell them the risk statistically are climbing. It's the stress of the procedure, general anesthesia, whatever, you could have a stroke or some other complication. We respect those numbers. There's a lot of patients in primary care less than 80 who are unhappy with atrial fibrillation. And these are folks who are um, very appropriate um, to have us get involved. So what actually happens when you send somebody for an AFib ablation? This is my ideal scenario. We implant a link. We collect at least 46, four to six weeks of their baseline rhythm. They get a pre-procedure CT or MRI to image their left atrium, get the size and shape of that chamber where we're gonna do our ablation so we really understand the chamber that we are working in. We stop their antiarrhythmic about a week before. They hold their blood thinner one or two days before. We do the ablation. We reset the link, restart their meds, send them home on post-procedure day one. They continue their therapy for three months, come back to us. If there's been no AFib on the drug, we take away the drug, march forward in time, see if you continue to have no AFib. If you've still had a fair amount, probably continue that another three to six months and then reassess again. That's our procedure going forward. And then of course that patient re returns to their referring MD. We don't have the capacity or the interest to take everyone's patients for ourselves and take them away from their primary care docs. It's very important to know that everyone goes back. We're there as a resource, but um, that's it. So your patient goes in the scanner. That's an MRI of a left atrium. There's the four pulmonary veins inserting into that chamber. So we're gonna ablate around those pulmonary veins and the anatomic variances between individuals are vast. So there's a lot of room for heterogeneity, extra vessels, there's one large common one on one side, who knows the size and shape of the chamber. We like to have that image to guide us. And then literally on the day of the procedure, we will decompose that image to get the picture in the bottom middle, which is your left atrium with the pulmonary vein insertions. And this is really our working uh, substrate for the procedure. What exactly do we do? We have two catheters in your left atrium. One is a star-shaped mapping catheter. We just splash it around the atrial chamber. It records all the electrical activity that it sees. And for the patient who's in AFib, that tells us all the hot spots in the heart where the AFib is coming from. The second catheter is an ablation catheter. It's irrigated, so it's spraying water or saline in every direction, uh, much like your shower. And with radio frequency energy, we're targeting all those hot spots that were identified with the mapping catheter to eliminate them. And we see the AFib organized, convert to sinus rhythm. When we feel that we've been thorough, we're done. Catheters come out and we wake the patient up and expect them to go home on the next day. Three to four hours per case, set up and, and take down time included. And um, this can be a wonderful, uh, therapy for the right for the right patient. There's a second technology that I'm not covering tonight. That's the cryo balloon therapy. It really has a role in paroxysmal AFib, where it's uh, um, it's a freezing technology that isolates each of those four pulmonary veins, and that's a good technology for um, the paroxysmal cases. We're not doing that uh, right now, but it's something that we have interest in. So here's an example of what we would see during the case. You can see where the red dot is, that the activity that we're recording from the wall of the atria is really fast and it's really complicated. Compared to the tissue right next door in bottom and gray, where it looks really regular, really organized, and much slower. So we'd say the fast, irregular, erratic, nasty looking stuff is what's relevant to that arrhythmia. And that's what we try to ablate so that we get all of that tissue to start looking what's by the gray dot, which is slow and organized, and hopefully during that transition that arrhythmia is unable to support itself and we truly have stomped out um, AFib for that individual. So that's our setup. Two catheters, chasing complex signals, watching things organize, being thorough, and being very individual in our approach to each person. So again, there's our left atrium. At a minimum, we go around all the pulmonary veins, pulmonary vein isolation. This is the backbone to the procedure. And then as that patient presents in a, in a 
from a paroxysmal to someone who's persistent or long-standing persistent, the more AFib has been there, the more work we do with all of those extra things um, that I talked about. So pulmonary vein isolation, everyone gets, and then depending on your clinical pattern, the more work we do um, to really eliminate that very complex rhythm. And again, our approach to AFib is something that we're proud of. It's something that's a little bit unique in the field, and it's something that we, again, published in um, the EP Lab Digest and had a fair amount of interest generated by that article. Again, that's our setup. The EP Lab is top right. There's a control room in the back. And then all those images, the CT images, the 3D mapping images, the complex signal images, watching our catheters, going through the process uh, that we described. Atrial flutter is a simple rhythm. It's a close cousin of atrial fibrillation. So we ablate for flutter rhythms. We'll see lots of flutter in your clinics, and that's an appropriate referral to us. It has all the stroke risk of AFib, so you have to be vigilant about um, anticoagulation. The loop recorders can be just as useful in a flutter patient as in a FIB patient, so don't be shy in thinking that technology can be important. In addition to ablation, what else can we do? And we have learned in our field that lifestyle is very important for people, so we need them to lose weight, get in shape. This reduces AFib burden, and it improves the efficacy of ablation. And this was a big deal in our field in the last one to two years, a study out of Australia, arrest AF, showing how optimizing your patient, improving their lifestyle, lose weight, control the sleep apnea, control the diabetes, the blood pressure, and the therapy gets so much more effective. And that was really quantified um, by the Australians in arrest AF. So control risk factors and the results of your ablation improve by a factor of five-fold, which is huge. And this is something that we've adopted, a strategy for our patients. We said we, can't, we don't have all the intensive diabetes clinics and weight loss clinics and sleep apnea clinics to coordinate your care and offer something on the level of those trials, but what we can do is make diet prescriptions for people. And we've encouraged our patients to adopt a Mediterranean diet which is widely recognized in cardiology to be very heart healthy, improving a variety of cardiac risk parameters. And um, this is kind of what we encourage our patients on, give them printed guidelines on how to adhere to a Mediterranean style diet. And we've seen nice weight loss and people feeling better, recovering from diabetes and sleep apnea, uh, just from that simple recommendation. And again, we, we published our recommendations for using a Mediterranean diet to extend the results of a REST AF, the Australian study, to all of our patients. Without being too fancy, we can get lots of people on board in terms of, in terms of lifestyle. So that's a, a part of our program too. There's, there's, there's more to this than just um, than catheters and technology. There's um, people behind all, all the stuff that we do. SVT, common nuisance arrhythmias. We see these in the ED all the time. Here's a narrow complex tachycardia. 180 to 200 beats a minute. Classic in that, in the female, fifth, sixth, seventh decade, that's when these things tend to show up. That's the burden in our population. Sometimes stops with breath hold bearing down. Now it's resistant. Now she's in the emergency room. Gave her adenosine, it broke. If that happens to one of your patients, that's an appropriate referral to electrophysiology. We can offer good therapy for these individuals. As a reminder, sometimes it's the pacemakers that tell us about these rhythms. And here is an elderly lady who was 90, had a pacemaker. Her pacemaker showed us that rhythm, and it was in fact that rhythm that was causing her concerning symptoms, not the slow heart rate. And um, based on the data the pacemaker gave us, we could ablate her, and she did much better. We do young people. This is a 26-year-old police officer, had Wolf Parkinson White. He would be giving chase, had to stop, the suspect got away because he was going into tachycardia. 200 plus beats a minute, um, and he, he, but he was an interesting story, and he in fact had Wolf Parkinson White. So not everyone's old and elderly. We do do young people. We're not yet doing pediatrics, but um, anyone over the age of 18 who you'd like us to see, we have an interesting cohort in that age group, and um, we've done three of these cases already in this past year at exactly this problem at the 
uh, Yakima Regional Medical Center and hairdresser age 50 all the way down to uh, undocumented worker age 17. We get all types, all comers, and um, we're happy to help. Teaching in our lab has been a big component. These rhythms are tricky to tease apart in terms of the mechanism, in terms of ablating. And uh, based on our experience and our training program in our EP lab, we've published our training protocol for other EP labs across the country to adopt and use as a way of getting technical staff to be more involved in the cases. And that's something that our techs have been really happy for in our lab is to get involved in the patient protocols, the electrical measurements, understand why these measurements are being made and what they show and what they represent and help us with the diagnosis. So it's fun and we've made that available to other labs. The thing coming out of fellowship that blew my mind was how many people in community practice have PVCs. In the academic centers, a PVC case is like, ooh, this is exotic. In community practice, these things are out there in spades. I read ECGs, reading 200 ECGs on the computer, all write down 10 names of high burden PVCs that need to get investigated. It's crazy what's out there, and I know they're in primary care. So this is common. Here we see an ECG. Every third beat is a PVC. And I know people are seeing these all the time. This deserves a Holter monitor with a referral to EP. If the burden is high enough, we need to do something about that. Why? Because PVCs cause symptoms. Every time that PVC beat comes, the blood flow that results from that beat is minimal, not very effective. So if your PVC burden is 10%, you can think of that as a 10% governor on your engine, and you're gonna be feeling that, the lack of blood flow, the sluggishness, the symptoms that go along with it. And some people, just the irregularity of it, they're very sensitive. Most people are way more sensitive than I am in my heart. I can't ever feel a thing. But some people feel absolutely every little beat of their heart and every little variation that you can imagine. And for those folks, these things drive them completely crazy. We've learned that if you have PVCs on the order of 10 to 20% chronically, chances are very good that your heart is going to suffer over time and start to lose function. So when that's the case, you have to advise these people that they have a risk of developing heart failure because of their PVC, and that can be a time to take action to control that, either with medication medications or um, with an ablation procedure. So we love these because the PVC could come from anywhere in the heart and you're never sure where it's coming from. So going into a case, you have to be ready to put a catheter anywhere in someone's heart um, where there's muscle tissue. So here's a 90 year old man. We ablated his PVC from inside his coronary cusp. It was coming from inside the heart valve and um, you can see here that when we come on ablation, that the PVCs that are so frequent now are almost immediately abolished at the appropriate time. So you get right on top of that focus, and you really, you know, you really know you're at ground zero. You can quite reliably ablate um, these PVCs and offer your patient a tremendous amount of benefit. This is the tease. Here is one that was equally available from the RVOT as it was from the great cardiac vein wrapping around the heart as it was from within the coronary cusp. You could affect it from all of those sites, could only get rid of it from within the great cardiac vein, the venous system of the heart. And um, that's the challenge going into these, is you never know until you're there where um, the effective site for a PVC will be. Here's another one from within the left ventricular chamber coming from the tip of the papillary muscle, which is that muscle apparatus that supports the function of the mitral valve. Those can be sources for extra beats. And in fact, where you can see the ablation catheter on the tip of that papillary muscle, um, we indeed got a PVC from exactly that spot. Again, this is an area of interest and it's tricky. And it's something that I worked on during my fellowship with my mentor um, in a very dedicated way, 
and we published on this topic, PVC ablation, an evolving niche for adult electrophysiologists. We're learning that PVCs are important. We're learning more and more about where they're coming from and how to get to them. And that's resulting in a nice uptick in complex ablation, which um, can offer our patients a lot of benefit. And it's an evolving niche. This is becoming more available. These things were not taken to the EP lab years ago. Now, more and more, we are taking these patients appropriately uh, to the EP lab. I tell my patient, no less than two hours and no more than four. It'll probably take us by two just to get you set up and to know what we're doing. If we don't have it by four, we're not getting it and we're out. So um, um, people have an easy time with that. Up to four hours on a table is, is reasonable. We can keep, keep you quite comfortable. So again, to summarize, we've talked about a lot of things really fast. Cardiac electrophysiology, who to refer, uh, symptoms, any suspicious or concerning symptoms like we talked about, give us a call, get us involved. We're happy to help at the level of making a diagnosis. Pacemakers, if there is a slow heart rate that concerns you, that's an appropriate consult. And we can get involved with the Holter monitoring, whatever it takes to prove the slow heart rate. If it's appropriate, implant the pacemaker. If you're concerned, you being a healthcare professional, that's enough for us to pick up and make a more detailed evaluation. Defibrillators, when you see those echo reports, if the ejection fraction is less than 35, even if it's 40-ish, good time to get us involved. We're not gonna do anything appropriate. We'll help you with the workup of that patient, and when it's appropriate, uh, we'll implant those devices that can be life-saving. If you have patients in your clinic who have pacemakers and have defibrillators and you're kind of managing them with the help of a rep, refer to cardiology for a one-stop shop evaluation. We can help optimize, look over the device, make sure it's meeting the patient's needs in the greatest way possible. Uh, so don't hesitate or think that that's a boring consult. We're happy to be involved um, to help you manage your patients better. And of course, then we send them back to you and you run the show. Atrial fibrillation, anyone less than 80 who's interested in alternatives to medication. Even if they want help with medication, we can help with medication. But if they're tired of meds and they want something else, that's an ablation patient and that's somebody who we can help you with. Certainly in making that as assessment, talking to that individual, presenting them with the option and moving forward. SVT. Anyone who's got those rapid heart rates, wants an alternative, to, an alternative to medication, is an appropriate referral for us. And finally, when you see PVCs, easiest thing to do is order a Holter with a referral. We'll look at the Holter, take it from there. If you want to do the workup on your own, if you see 5 to 20% PVCs on a 24-hour monitor, that's a problem. If those PVCs are making somebody symptomatic, that's an appropriate referral. And... Um, That 5 to 20% burden, again, possibility of causing a um, cardiomyopathy in the future, and we need to advise our patients um, about that possibility, even if the PVC is not something that's actively, actively bothering them. I hammer this home on my partners, and they look at me with glazed eyes. I'm, you know, so if you get it, you're way ahead. Thank you. Thanks.